Barbara Starr at the Pentagon, good report. Thanks very much. Uh, let's immediately go to the president. He's here at this town hall in Iowa. He's speaking about issue number one for Americans, jobs, jobs, jobs. The problem is, is that we've got the kind of partisan brinksmanship that is willing to put party ahead of country. That, that's, that's more interested in seeing their political opponents lose than seeing the country win. And nowhere was that more evident in this most recent debt ceiling debacle. The fact of the matter is that our debt and deficits are manageable if we make some intelligent choices and make sure that they're shared sacrifices as well as shared opportunities. And had we made some decent decisions over just the last two, three months, had we been willing to seize the opportunity that was before us, then there is no reason why we had to go through this downgrade. Because that did not have to do with economics, that had to do with politics. It was an assessment that our Congress is not able to come up with the kinds of compromises that move this country forward. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty frustrated about that. I am pretty frustrated about that because given the challenges we face, we don't have time to play games. There are a lot of folks, a lot of our neighbors, a lot of our friends who've been out of work too long. We've got too many small businesses that are struggling. I see a lot of young people in the audience here today, and they're thinking about what are their prospects for the future. Graduating from college, knowing they've got a lot of debt, needing to find a job, they don't have patience for the kind of shenanigans we've been seeing on Capitol Hill. They understand that now is the time for all of us to pull together and do what it takes to grow the economy and put people back to work. Now, the good news is there are things we could be doing right now that would make a difference for our economy. Back in December, uh, when uh, some of my folks on the other side of the aisle were more willing to compromise, we were able to put a package together that cut taxes for families by an average of $1,000. And what I've said is let's continue this payroll tax cut in the next year so as the economy is strengthening, ordinary families who are still digging themselves out of credit card debt or are seeing their homes underwater, they've got a little more purchasing power. That'll be good for small businesses and large businesses, and they will hire. We could right now say we are going to go ahead and renew that tax cut, and that would be good for the American people and good for the economy. There's no reason to wait. There's no reason for us to wait putting construction workers back to work all across the country. Nobody took a bigger hit than those who were involved in the housing boom when the boom went bust. So why don't we put them to work right now, rebuilding our roads and our bridges and our schools all across America? There's a proposal in Congress right now. Congress should pass it and get it done. There's no reason why we shouldn't be helping our small businesses and startup businesses. We've passed 16 tax cuts for small businesses. And right now, we've got a bill pending that is called the American Invents Bill. It basically reforms our patent system, so if somebody's got a creative idea, they can turn it into a business right away without red tape, without bureaucracy. That's who we are, a nation of inventors. This traditionally has had bipartisan support. What are we waiting for? We should pass it right now to give a spark to industry. We've got, we've got pending trade legislation. Tom Bilsack and I were uh, talking uh, on, on the way over, on the bus here. And the truth of the matter is, is that the agricultural sector in America, the cornerstone of states like Iowa, is doing very well. 
but we could be doing more. And my general attitude is, why don't we want to open up markets so that the extraordinary bounty of the heartland of America is making its way there, but also manufacturing is making its way there. Look, you know, we've got, uh, we've got a whole bunch of Kias and, and Hyundais here in the United States of America on our roads, and that's fine and good. But I want some Chryslers and some GMs and some Fords on the roads of South Korea as well. We should go ahead and get those trade deals done. So there are a whole host of ideas that we could be implementing right now that traditionally have had bipartisan support. The only thing that is preventing us from passing them is that there's some folks in Congress who think that doing something in cooperation with me or this White House, that that somehow is bad politics. Well, you know what? You guys didn't send us there to be thinking about our jobs. You sent us there to be thinking about your jobs and your future. Now, we do have to be thinking about how we invest in education and how we invest in infrastructure and how we invest in basic research, but still do it while the government is living within its means. And neither party is blameless on this. The truth is, we had a balanced budget in 2000, the last time we had a Democratic president. And what we ended up doing was we had two wars that we didn't pay for, a prescription drug plan we didn't pay for. We had two tax cuts that we did not pay for. And the result was a burgeoning debt. And then what ended up happening was because of the recession and the lack of regulation on Wall Street, this wrenching recession meant less tax revenues coming in and more going out because we were providing help to states to make sure teachers and, and uh, police officers and firefighters weren't laid off and to make sure that uh, we could help small businesses and, and put people back to work. So we've got a genuine problem with deficits and debt. But here, here, again, is the good news. If everybody is willing to make some modest sacrifices, this problem we could solve. We could solve it tomorrow. We could solve it next week. If the Speaker of the House had taken the bargain that he and I were talking about, we would have had it solved last month. And we would not have gone through everything that we went through over the last several weeks. But it does require compromise, and it requires some balance. You know, Warren Buffett had an article uh, published today in which he said, stop coddling billionaires. He pointed out that uh, I think he made about $36 million on income. It was, I guess, an off year for him. But he pointed out that he paid an effective rate of 17% when it came to taxes, which meant that he paid a lower tax rate than anybody else in his office, including a secretary, because most of his income came in the form of capital gains. And he made a simple point. He said, look, nobody's income has gone up faster than the top 1%. In fact, nobody's gone up faster than the top one-tenth of 1%. There's nothing wrong when it comes to closing our deficit and managing our debt to say that we should ask a little bit of help from everybody. I don't want a tax cut if it means that senior citizens have to pay an extra $6,000 a year for their Medicare. That's not fair, and that's not right. I, I, I think it makes sense for us to say, you know what, let's close some loopholes that only oil and, and gas companies are able to take advantage of to make sure that we don't have to cut back on Pell Grants for students who are trying to go to college and get a, get a better education. Now, that, that doesn't mean that we defend every single government program. Everybody's got to make sacrifices. There are programs that aren't working well. And sometimes there are those in my party who 
We'll defend everything, even if it's not working. Well, we, we do have to make some, some cuts on things that we don't need. And, and that allows us to invest in the things that we do. But there's got to be balance, and there's got to be fairness. And that's not just my view. The majority of Republicans agree with that view. Although I have to tell you, when I saw the other day, uh, you know, my uh, friends in the Republican uh, presidential primary, uh, they, they were asked, would you take a deal in which for every $1 of tax increases, we cut $10 in government spending? 10 to 1 ratio. And nobody was willing to take that deal. Now, what that tells me is, okay, you've gotten to the point where you're just thinking about politics. You're not thinking about common sense. You've got to be willing to compromise in order to move the country forward. So it, it, here's the upshot. We do have real challenges. We're going to have to make some tough decisions. And I know that during the two and a half years that I've been president, you know, we've gone through a lot of ups and downs and a lot of tough times. And our job is not finished until every single American who's looking for a job can find a job. And until we have fixed the problems that caused me to run for president in the first place so that we're growing a middle class and people have basic security and they know if they're following the rules, if they're working hard, if they're looking after their families and meeting their responsibilities, that they've got a chance at the American dream. You guys are meeting your responsibilities. You're meeting your responsibilities. You're working hard, and if you've, if you've gotten laid off and you don't have a job, you're out there looking for a job. You're looking after your family. You're tightening your belt where you need to, but you're still making investments to help your kids with their future. You're, you're operating with common sense, and you're donating time at your church or a food pantry or Little League. Well, if you're meeting your responsibilities, the least you can ask is your elected representatives meeting theirs. And so... I understand that after this last midterm, you voted for divided government. But you didn't vote for dysfunctional government. You, you, didn't, you didn't vote for a broken government that can't make any decisions, can't move the country forward at all. That's not what you voted for. And so, you know, some people uh, have been saying, well, uh, Mr. President, why don't you call Congress back for a special session? And what I've said is the last thing the people need for confidence right now is to watch folks on Capitol Hill arguing all over again. What they need to do is come to Decor, or go to Cannon Falls or meet with their constituents back home and hear the frustration and understand that people are sick and tired of the nonsense and the po political games. And hopefully when they come back in September, they're going to have a wake-up call that says, we need to move the country forward. You've got to start focusing on doing the people's business. That's what everybody's expecting. I want you to help hold all of us accountable, me included. I am enlisting you in this fight. Because if you are, if you're making your voices heard, if you're letting people know that enough is enough, it is time to move forward, it is time for us to win the future. If, if your voices are heard, then sooner or later, these guys have to start paying attention. And if they don't start paying attention, then they're not going to be in office. And we'll have a new Congress in there that will start paying attention to what is going on all across America. I'm confident in the power of your voice. I'm confident in your values. Those are the values that we share. I don't care whether you're a Democrat or Republican or an independent. All of us here are patriots and everybody here cares about our country and puts it first. And if, if we can have that kind of politics, then nothing can stop us. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless you.
Thank you. All right, so the President of the United States, he's a Democrat, but he's in Iowa right now. Uh, a lot of Republicans have been in Iowa, remain in Iowa. It's the first contest that's coming up you, for the Republican presidential nomination. Uh, we have a lot to digest of what we just heard right. from the President. I want to remind you, tomorrow, I'm here in Iowa as well. I'll be sitting down for a one-on-one -on -one interview with the President here in Iowa. That interview will air tomorrow, right here in the Situation Room. Uh, the President... Uh, beginning to find his groove, you just heard right now, is beginning to get a little bit into that political campaign. Mojo will have much more from Decorah, Iowa, much more from this town hall meeting. Q&A coming up when we come back. The president answering a tough question from someone here in Decorah, Iowa. Why didn't he work harder to repeal the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy? Let's listen into his answer. Republicans would not go along with just voting for continuing the middle class tax cuts and letting the high end lapse. And what that meant was the choice I had to make would have been to let all the Bush tax cuts lap, including those for the middle class, which would have meant that the average family saw their taxes go up $3,000 on average at a time when they were still digging themselves out of a debt hole. It would have been very bad for the economy. We also would not have gotten uninsurance, uh, uh, unemployment insurance continued into this year, we would not have been able to do the payroll tax, and so the economy would have been much weaker. And so I made a decision that it was better for us at that point to strengthen the economy because we only extended those tax cuts for another two years. And we would be able to take our case to the American people as the economy got stronger as to why we've got a different approach than the Republicans do. Now, on this debt ceiling, it's pretty straightforward. I felt that it was important for us to try to solve the problem rather than play games. And that was particularly important because if we had allowed default, if you think that the stock market gyrations this last couple of weeks was bad, if we had had a default, then we might not genuinely might have gone back into a financial crisis. Because the truth of the matter is, even though we got downgraded, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, when, when the market got all crazy, what do you think people bought? Where did they put their money to avoid risk? They bought Treasury bills. So the market voted to say, we have complete confidence in America right now. But if we had defaulted, that meant that we might not have the legal authority to issue Treasury bills, and we would have had problems making our Social Security payments, making our payments to our troops, our veterans and so forth. And that was not a risk worth taking. Now, I know that people would like to say, well, j just, you know, do something to, to, to get these guys under control. This was a unique situation in which, frankly, you know, the collateral damage from an actual default would have been so great that I didn't want to risk the livelihoods and the well-being of millions of people, even though I thought the other side was very unreasonable. Now, that's a unique circumstance. Moving forward, my basic attitude is we know what to do. I'll be putting forward, when they come back in September, a very specific plan to boost the economy, to, to create jobs, and to control. All right, so the President of the United States uh, just saying he's going to uh, put forward a specific plan in September. Once Congress comes back from their five-week recess, the President will announce a specific plan to deal with jobs and the economy. He's not announcing details right now, uh, but he is at least saying that he will come up with a major new plan in September. Lots to assess right here from Iowa, much more of what the president is saying, our analysts are saying right after this.